Alright, way back, you can sneak forward. Um, so we'll just talk like this. Uh, I'm Gerard Jones, I used to write comic books, I am really interested in comic book history and have written about comics. We wrote a book called Men of Tomorrow, it's about the early days of comics, um, in which I misrepresented the Malcolm Wheeler Nicholson, which <laughs> sort of led to us knowing each other. <laughs> And, uh, in fact, Nikki and I are uh, working on a book um, that's biography of the major and his role in comics, but not just his role in comics. Um, which is kind of a large amends making for me in a way. <laughs> but it's, it's come to fascinate me, too. He's a really, he's an interesting guy, and we're going to hear about him. Um, so this is Nikki Wheeler Nicholson. Uh, Who's had a, you've had a really interesting life. That sort of gets lost in all this, but we'll, we'll talk about Japan. She's an actress and writer and all kinds of things. But, um, but the major, uh, <coughs> give us a sense. We'll just kind of go chronologically, um, which is how I think. Everything I think is chronological. I ended up writing history books. Um, wh what was his background? What was, what was the early life? What, what molded him? Uh, well, uh, his... Uh, my great grandmother, his mother, was a suffragette, which is why we have this ridiculous hyphenated name. Uh, for a long time, I thought that it was just because my family can be pretentious sometimes. <laughs> 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 and then uh, David Saunders, who uh, it, his dad, Norman Saunders, it, was a wonderful pulp cover artist. I mean, just fabulous artist. Uh, David and I were together at a pulp convention one time. We were talking and, I, and he said, well, you know why you have a hyphenated name? And I said, uh, I don't know. What? <laughs> and he said, because your grandmother was a suffragette. And I thought, oh, okay. <laughs> that makes sense because uh, she called herself Wheeler Strain, Strawn, originally for her first husband who was actually my grandfather's father. And he was no good. And so she got rid of him. And she <laughs> married T.J.D. Nicholson, an Englishman. And so she became Wheeler Nicholson. And my grandfather took that name because he loved his stepfather, really revered him. And his mother, my grandmother, and his stepfather, T.J.B., were both a very big influence on his life. T.J.B. was a very aristocratic Englishman, so if you've read any of my grandmother's <coughs> stories, there's often an aristocratic Englishman in the story. <laughs> and uh, so, obviously, he did have a big influence on my grandfather, and my, gr my great-grandmother definitely had an influence on him. I discovered so many amazing things about her. When I was looking up uh, military records on my grandfather, I found records of her that were in the declassified military files, intelligence files. So she was a character too, and that whole sense, he grew up with that sense of adventure, that sense of that you could just go out and do anything. And, uh, but that you always had to be a gentleman while you were doing it. <laughs> um, and so he grew up in a family that uh, didn't always have a lot of money, but they knew everybody. Uh, Teddy, he, they were friends with the Roosevelts. Corinna Roosevelt was a friend of my great grandmother's. Uh, so there was a lot of, of the, the atmosphere was. What would you say? Uh, well, I think in a way, if you want, that's a little thumbnail of his worldview. I think think Teddy Roosevelt, um, because he was born in the major was born in 1890. Right. Would have been eight years old when the when the Rough Riders went up San Juan Hill. And they were from already a horsey family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Military background. Right. And so that sort of um, mainstream Republican progressive uh, right culture was where they came from. Um, and they um, they were he he was born in. Tennessee, early part right. of his life, although the family had come down from uh, Illinois during the Civil War. Right. And uh, his, his grandfather had fought in the Civil War on the Union side and uh, was, was revered uh, as a soldier. And, 
there was a family portrait of him with his sword, and he had been a cavalry officer also. So that was also part of the family history. And my grandfather went east uh, in 1910 uh, to uh, Manlius St. John, where he went to military school with planning to go into the army. And at that time, there were four feeder schools that uh, you went to, and then you got into the Army as a, a second lieutenant. So that's exactly what he did. He graduated in, I think, two and a half years instead of the regular four, because he was very smart and uh, very determined. And his mentor, uh, uh, General Verbeck, who uh, ran the school there, also had a huge influence on him. Really interesting guy. Um, and so then he got into the Army, and he was stationed under Pershing on the Mexican border, and they were chasing outlaws. There was some Pancho Villa activity in there. But the interesting thing about that is my grandfather was commanding Troop K of the African American Buffalo Soldiers. And um, I just found that fascinating. And he's, he wrote a number of stories in which uh, there are African American soldiers, and what was great about them, there's the dialogue, which doesn't make us all happy, but the characters were drawn really well, and often they played as important a part in the story as the as the uh, other characters, and I, I just really love that, that he was just clear that, you know, these guys were as important and their characters were good and they were as well drawn as his other characters. So that obviously was a big influence on him as well. And then he ended up, uh, he took that group of soldiers to the Philippines, and I'll talk about that when we talk about the court martial. But um, after that, he went to uh, Siberia during World War I. He was with the American Expeditionary Force in Siberia. And he was in military intelligence. And um, that was also a huge influence on him. And he wrote about uh, Siberia and the Cossacks and that whole period in Russia that was in such chaos and really interesting, complicated uh, situation, and he wrote about it frequently in his stories. And so if you ever get a chance to read any of those, it, they're, they're all well written and very good. When were they published? Uh, he started writing in 19, well the first pulp story I found was 1924, and his last pulp story was 1956, so he had a span, all that span of period of writing pulp. In, in the midst of doing comics and everything else. Yeah. And in the, an interesting piece in the mix is the whole military story. But he also liked to draw cartoons. He was a, he was a sketcher. And I, I, this is something to look into. If anybody wants to look into more of this, uh, let me know. We'll do some of our research for us. I'll <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you in small print in the end notes. Um, his mentor, the head of the Manly School, was William Verbeck, um, who was a well-respected general at the time. His brother was Gustav Verbeck, who did a comic strip called The Upside Downs, um, mm. which was very popular and still well regarded. I think didn't Pete Moreski just bring out a big fancy book of The Upside Downs? So there's this odd link there to the, and I haven't found that they had any contact, but it's intriguing that here he was drawing all these cartoons in the Manlius School um, yearbook, and I was sort of known around campus as a, you know the kid who drew cartoons, and then there's this connection to one of the major cartoons. It's kind of forgotten now the big time cartoon. So there's something, there's a sense of some destiny happening, if nothing else, and some moving yeah. toward comics, which I, I would, learning about this early part of his life, I would not think, oh, that guy's going to be a comic book publisher. You know, um, it's a different, it's a different, <laughs> it's a different path. So talk about um, the court martial. Talk about the, and I know that gets really complicated, but hit the highlights of his, his struggle with the high command. So when I started researching the court-martial, he was court-martialed in 1923, and it's all in the New York Times if you go online and look at uh, from about February 1st to about March, uh, uh, at the end of March in, in 1923, there's all this stuff about the court-martial in the New York Times. 
what happened was he wrote an open letter to President Harding talking about Prussianism in the army. And uh, you don't go over the head of your superior in the army and write an open letter in the New York Times to the President of the United States. You just, that, that's, you don't do that. <laughs> and he did. <laughs> and he knew full well what was going to happen. Um, and it was all couched in this terminology. And for years, I kind of tried to figure out what it was all about. And then Bob Wedeman, who is a military historian at the um, U.S. I, I have all these guys who help me out. I mean, just the amazing amount of research. And people like Bob have just been fantastic. And so Bob was interested in my grandfather and found out about me. And he got in touch with me. And he had been doing some research. And he feels that what happened to my grandfather and that terminology, Prussianism, had to do with a racial incident in the Philippines. So my grandfather took the Buffalo Soldiers to the Philippines and there was a white colonel, Southern, why, oh dear, and he was prejudiced. This was 1915. He was prejudiced and he harassed my grandfather's men a lot. And my grandfather did not like that. And so he challenged his superior officer to a, a contest with his men and the colonel's men. And what they were going to do was it was going to be a contest of machine gun readiness. So these guys all have to get on horseback, and they have to do a certain, uh, they have to do certain tactics, and then they jump off their horses and they throw their machine guns together, and they're ready. And so, so the major said, "My men can whoop your men," <laughs> and the colonel said, "Oh no!" So they set up this contest, and it got to be kind of uh, notorious. So. There were other people in the army who showed up to see this contest between these two groups. Well, guess what? My grandfather's men beat the pants off of these other guys. And on top of that, they broke all the world's records. And it was written up in all these books and magazines. And so that colonel didn't like my grandfather after that. They were not friends. And he started harassing my grandfather in the military on every little tiny thing he could find. And my grand, my great grandmother, who had all these connections with the Roosevelts, she got him sent to Siberia <laughs> and to escape this. And so he was in Siberia and all of this was kind of law, you know, it all kind of uh, calmed down. And then after World War One, my grandmother was just desperate to go to Europe to have a part in that, and of course he missed the, the uh, finding, but then he was sent to help in the, the you know, re reconstruction and getting everything all cleaned up. Guess who he ended up under? Same guy from the Philippines. And the guy just started harassing the hell out of him. I mean, just unbelievably, till my grandfather just couldn't take it anymore, and he thought, Okay, what the hell? I'm just going to write a letter to the president and be done with it. So that's why it was couched in the terms of Prussianism. But Bob has done a lot, both Bob and I have done a lot of research in the military files, and it's pretty clear that that's what happened. Because this guy was also, there were other incidents of him doing the same thing. So the Army asked him to leave. <laughs> and he can be gone. So it's the early 1920s. His whole life has been about being a military officer, and now yeah. he's not. And um, give us a sense of yeah. We, what, what, well, give us a sense of him as a personality too. What who, who was? Well, I I never knew my grandfather. Um, I only know of him for what I've uh, researched, and of course from my family, my dad, the way people are in my family, and the way they talk about him, and uh, because I'm from the same gene pool. And um, 
my sense of him from everything, from everybody in my family, is that, and also I love the pictures of him because he had a number of, of things that happened to him in his life that were difficult and very challenging that would have just knocked most people down. And he always just seemed to take it on the chin, take responsibility for what he did, not complain, not whine, not carry on. He just picked himself up and just kept moving. And I, I think that is a really important part of his character. And um, it's what I'm really, I'm really proud of him for. I just think he was an amazing person. And um, he, he, most of the photographs of him, he's smiling, he's um, enjoying himself. Even when they had no money, he, you know, he just enjoyed himself. And he gave that to our family, that no matter what, you, you need to behave yourself, behave like a lady, a gentleman at all times, be kind to people, and have a good time. And that's, I, I think that's really his whole, that was his, the way he was. How does he become a writer? What's this big jump from an ex gallery well, officer? Well, my, my great-grandmother was a writer. Um, she, th this, we're talking about a woman who was, uh, she was born in 1868. And she wrote for newspapers after her first husband, uh, my great-grandfather, great left her uh, she started writing, and you have to think about, that, that was the 1880s, 90s, this woman is putting herself out there, and she's got these long Victorian skirts on, and she's out there with the men being a journalist, a reporter, and writing, and so that was part of the family culture as well, that whole writing, the sense of writing, and when uh, my grandfather, who was uh, called Nick, uh, when he got out of um, uh, high school, he, his first job was as a reporter for one of the big uh, Portland, Oregon uh, newspapers. So he started writing at an early age, and then uh, he just, in one of the newspaper articles when he left the Army, uh, he and my grandmother, Ilsa, uh, both had aspirations to be writers, so that was something already in his mind that he wanted to do. And he jumped right in and started writing uh, for the pulps. First the nonfiction, The Modern Cavalry, he wrote a book about it. Oh, right, right, I forgot about that. He wrote a book in 1922 called The Modern Cavalry, and that is an interesting book to me. I never thought I'd be interested in all this military stuff. I mean, it's not exactly my thing. But I've become fascinated with it, and he, his book, um, The Modern Cavalry, is mostly about how to behave like a gentleman, and, uh, you know, so an officer and a gentleman type of thing. And uh, I think Lucian Prescott, uh, who uh, wrote a number of wonderful books about Vietnam, he quotes my grandfather's book in some of his books, uh, this concept of an officer and a gentleman. And then he writes, then the fiction. So take that and the, his sense of the what his protagonist, his hero, when he's writing an Argosy and Adventure magazine. So he started out um, his first uh, his first uh, um, stories were much more autobiographical. So the character he created an alter ego character called Lieutenant Captain Major Davy. <laughs> and so Major Lieutenant Captain Major Davies um, had some, of, interestingly, had some of the same experiences that my grandfather did. And so they were much more autobiographical and therefore they were really, they were really interesting to me because they could make clues about things. And um, I went to Fort Bliss last year when I was doing one of my cross-country treks. And there's a, 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 a the opening of uh, Beelzebub the Bane, and he described my grandfather describes the, uh, the the geography, and I I pulled into the museum at Fort Bliss and I looked up and it there it was it was so amazing you know that his description 
just completely captured it even 70 something years later it you know even though there's uh, you know shopping centers all around that you know the the rocks and the mountain were very much the same so that was kind of a wonderful thing